Hello, gorgeous. You see, in this world, there's two kinds of people, my friend. Be afraid. Be very afraid. You're tearing me apart! Go on to your butt. Round up the usual suspects. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Man Bites Retro. That's Woman right. Woman Bites, Man Retro. Bites Retro. Woman. I don't know about that. I, I don't think know how, so. I don't like how that sounds. I really, really do. I think do. man sounds better. Just I think man. woman is inherently better. I, I think we all can agree that, that women are better. Well, yeah. would you make me sleep on the couch if I don't agree? A little bit. Oh, damn it. Okay. So... Everybody knows this is the inner turmoil that you have in a relationship because it's pretty fucking spot on. Um, But anyways, let's get back to actually talking about movies. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. 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 Or actually start watching about movies. Yeah. So this week we're actually going to be doing something a little different. We're actually going to be talking about a particular actor that we both find inner peace in one of their movies or or kind of a connection with. (laughs) (laughs) So, this actor started off with Rocky Horror Picture Show in 75 as Frank, Dr. Frankfurter. And he found this iconic cult classic following, basically, from this. And started basically making his movies after that. He really, like, it took a good five, six years after Rocky Horror to break through and actually start making films. And, of course, for anybody that doesn't know... Tim Curry, the, the majestic legend that is Tim Curry. And this week we are actually going to choose two movies, one for each of us, and we're going to pick our favorite film of Tim Curry to talk about. Sounds like a plan. So you want to go first? I guess Ladies so. first. La- woman. Women first. Lady. Women. Lady. Okay. Whatever you say. <laughs> My pick for this week was actually the 1985 movie Clue. Ooh, Ooh. Wadsworth. Yes. Nice. And the reason I picked this is because I think it combines the best of all of Tim Curry's wonderful attributes. It has comedy. It has more of that sinister element. And it's really the culmination of everything I love about him. The fact that he was willing to push the envelope and play the extreme of a character. And I think that this movie is one of those where he got to do a lot of different things during it. He got to be really serious. He got to be panicked. He got to be very evil at some point. So I just think it's one of those that it allowed him to really spread his wings sort of in the same way that Frankenfurter did because he was allowed to take a character and run with it. Because there was no established what this character is, he could really just grow with it and expand upon it any way he wanted to and so much of in in this movie especially with the cast that was in it was all we're talking a star-studded cast and they were able to play off each other and i think so much of it was driven off of how amazing tim curry was because he was a central focus in the movie so the way he he was the guy throughout the whole movie and he really was like you could see the little nuances that he played in different movies from home alone 2 to uh, what do you call it? Even it, you saw those little characteristics in his facial expressions, in his like kind of little moments that he has in the movie. Well, I think he's one of those actors that he really embodies the role that he's in, and you don't see, you don't think, okay, t- it's Tim Curry in this role, it's and Tim Curry in that role, but he's always the same person across the board. No, he's always different, and he just takes on those characters and just even if they are regular quote-unquote people like Wadsworth and Clue you know it's not like it it's not like Frankenfurter where they're in they're very eccentric off the wall characters and things like that he still was able to embody that and what I love about him most especially in Clue is the fact that so much of his is his of his performances and the way his eyes move and the way he interacts and his body movements it's not necessarily the words he says or but what I also love is the fact that a lot of it is how he says it. And also Anyone else he... delivering the line, it would be completely flat. But it's just the way he says it. And how he interacts with all those other major actors. Yeah, And his There's... implications with his yes. words. The way that he delivers the line and kind of stops, pauses, 
and allows that facial expression to take over and finish the sentence without even completing it. Absolutely. Which you saw the beginning of that at Rocky Horror, and then he just evolved with every single film that he did. Mm -hmm. And then doing the voice acting, I mean, that's essential. Yes. That is the essential, and half of his career is voice acting. Yes, absolutely. For Disney movies, out of all things, which is ironic, where he started. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But another reason I picked this movie is really a part of it is that ensemble cast. Because I think sometimes those fall flat because you get a group of people together and the the, the chemistry is not there. And I don't think that this was like that at all. I think they all work together beautifully. They played off of each other beautifully. And that's part of the magic of this movie. And I think especially because you're dealing with a movie that's based off a board game. Yeah. And it's a murder mystery. It is a murder mystery. But that takes the whodunit theme to that very, that extreme in the best possible way. So in a previous episode, we talked about Evil Under the Sun and the Agatha Christie style. Yeah. This is that same thing where it's that whodunit, and you get that um, that nostalgia from playing the game yeah. when you were a child. So you get all of that and bringing these characters to life. Because who didn't have their character that they always played in that? Exactly. You know, and Wadsworth wasn't even a character in the game. So he was a just a creation a of this movie. And that's one of the great things is Tim Curry was creating a role that wasn't part of the original game, but it was such a central point. Of bringing this game to life. It's the way that you could actually move it into the real life. Because there has to be that bystander to see all these events. Absolutely. And I think he was definitely the bystander. He is the audience that is playing the board game. Yes. And we're seeing all these characters run around and doing this. And you know that you didn't do it because you're playing the board game. Right. But one of the characters that you are playing actually did. And I think that's... We become the audience through him. So he is the most crucial character in this film because of that. And I think that's fascinating. But cards on the table, I'm going to say, when I was growing up, I always, always miss, a Scar- miss Scarlet. And she's the one I loved in the movie because I love Leslie Ann Warren. And I love just, you know, she's that amazing, beautiful woman that comes in. <laughs> but uh, later in life, I believe that I connect more with Mrs. White. I oh. love her and I love Madeline Kahn. And I love her as a character in this because she's, again, one of those... Madeline Kahn is one of those amazing actresses who takes on a role and takes it to his extreme. You just have a fascination with with but Ken. That that's, that's I the really thing. I really do, but some of her lines are pure magic. When she's talking about her husband, he's just lying on the couch and just <laughs> And, and they the cut point... up his, you know, <laughs> all the men cross their <laughs> legs. You know, it's just perfect. I love her so much. But again, I love the way Tim Curry just reacts just with his face. He doesn't even need yeah. to say anything. You see his entire reaction. And that's part of that magic of how he was able to connect with every single character and the actors that played them. So that's just that's why I picked that movie, just because I love it so much. Mainly because of the cast and how they brought that wonderful board game to life in a way that was seamless and didn't feel forced. And, yeah. and sort of like how some of those movies that are based off of rides or other games, it can feel very kitschy and you're like, okay, this isn't really related to the game or it's really forced. If This didn't feel that way. I think it, the only other time you know, that we saw a good example of that is, say, Jumanji. Was the game out before the it movie, was, though? Yeah, yeah it yeah. was out before. Okay, yeah. So, so I think that's a good example, but it's acknowledging the fact that it's a game. It wasn't like it was trying to... Exactly. Whereas Clue, they don't acknowledge that it's a game, but they take all the pieces from. That's the best part. They take well, they do all say of the it's pieces. A game. They they do, but they don't like Jumanji is literally around a board game, game as opposed yeah. to Clue. But they pulled out all the best pieces of the board game. You know, the weapons, the yeah. characters, the rooms, the ambiance. When you see the weapons, you're you just like completely enthralled in it. And with yeah. it's it's like you said, there is this connectivity with one character in particular. For me, it was Christopher Lloyd. Because oh, I absolutely. always played uh, Professor Plum when I played the game. Right. And when he played that, I was like, oh my god, yes, I'm Doc. Yes. But I think it's one of those things where like, when you play the game now, after having seen the movie, you oh, yeah. connect even more with it. Because you envision yourself as that character, as Professor Plum, as Christopher Lloyd, as Professor Plum. Like you, like, you feel more attached to the game because it's been brought to life in a really tangible way. And a really well done way. Oh, yeah. That the characters are connectable and they, they, they fall in line with what the story actually implies. Well, yeah. And, and I think that's fascinating. And when we were talking about one of the things I mentioned while we were watching the movie is the fact that just the sounds, yeah. they're so pronounced during it. When they're eating their soup and, and the way the, 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 the bowls like kind of click against the, the, cling against the silverware or when they're unlocking cabinets, it's all very pronounced. Yeah. And I love that because it builds the tension of that movie and it just it never gets old to me. I, I agree with you. Watching this again and sitting back and watching the alternate endings and all that stuff, I think it was very fascinating to see that. And again, that is the importance of film. 
as a as a medium of art because it is the evolution of all these different art mediums and putting them together in this nice neat package that it centralizes around this one story but all the soundscapes the visual scapes the acting the theater esque of it that that all contributes to every moment of this film and building that connection with you and the characters that are being portrayed and Uh, There is nothing like film done right. And this is a film done right for sure. Well, and it's interesting you say that because I don't think about it. It almost has that feel of a play. Yeah. Like you're like you're going to watch a play and you're in a darkened theater watching it all play out because but it I mean they're in different it. but they're in different rooms and granted you wouldn't have that so much in play but it does feel like that and I think their acting feels like that too because they're almost overacting but in the best possible way not as like and the lack of music way. yeah the lack of music in the film which I think there's only one or two scores throughout the whole film yeah and it's just like. It's really not even to build tension, which it is very rare Mm -hmm. that a film builds tension without an escalation in music. Yes, that's true. A climactic sense of music and everything to build the tension because that's that kind of false, cheap popcorn Well, and it maybe speaks to the fact that they're trying to build it around the uh, the realism of a murder where it's more tense that there's no noise. Exactly. It's the lack of noise that builds the tension more than anything else. I find that fascinating because films like that, they don't risk that anymore Mm -hmm. because audiences are so like kind of used to it now. They have to have the emotional cues. And it's like a laugh track, say, in a, on a comedy show. When you don't have a laugh track, it feels that much better because you could actually laugh at the jokes that are real. Yeah. You're not being forced to do it. So, my film that I wanted to talk about... Which he wouldn't tell me in advance. That's right. No spoiler alerts for me. It is actually falls in the same year. Okay. 1985. So, both of our films are from 85. Ironically, the year that we're born. We were born. born, yes. That is so <laughs> weird. But this is legend, of course. This, it's really Scott at his peak, and it's, that film just holds a special place. Uh, For anybody that hasn't seen it, it is a fantasy film about two people that fall in love, um, what do you call it, Uh, uh, Tom Cruise, and, oh my god, I blanked out on her name, oh, I'm gonna (laughs) kill myself for this one, Mia Sarah, uh, both of them fall in love, but... Uh, what do you call it? Tom Cruise's character is actually a fairy, and Mia Sarah is the the human. Okay. And the problem is, though, is that darkness, which is played by Tim Curry, which is this demonic force, and he is like, no, I will hunt down the last unicorn and kill the unicorn that represents peace and and prosperity and and like light, basically. And by killing this unicorn, I could bring the the world into into darkness. And because unicorns are attracted to love and and the relationship that's prosperous, he follows these two people that are in love. Mm-hmm. One that is a, a is a fairy, and the other one that that's a human. Okay. Yeah. And he finds the final moment where because the fairy wants to show off. And show him, show her what, uh, you know, the magic of the world and everything. So she is shown a unicorn for the first time, which is part of the magic realm. And by doing that, she kind of contaminates the magic realm. And darkness is able to take hold. I don't know if you ever connected with this movie at all. Not on the same level you did, obviously. (sighs) But, you know, I'm, I'm doing a quick look over about it and... What I think is interesting is the fact that a lot of Tim Curry's movies seem that they weren't really popular when they were released. He's built, they became yeah. cult classics later on. Oh, this is a huge cult classic. Yeah. But I think that's true of a lot of his movies where they weren't box office success necessarily, but later on they become such a big thing and they become embedded as part of this, again, the nostalgia. Yeah. I think that's such a huge part of it. And it's it's one of those things where if you connected it with the first time, you're gonna it's gonna stay with you throughout your entire life. You're not gonna throw away any of these. And I think again, it speaks to him building those characters, those memorable characters that you just don't want to let go of. Yeah, yeah. And then Tim Curry actually grabs Mia Sarah and yeah. takes takes her as his as uh, his wife, and that is interesting because you could see that never ending story all these movies that are fantasy films yeah. grab that storyline and follow with it mm-hmm. because it's the corruption of youth by by the darkness right and there i remember watching this when i was like 3 or 4 years old my dad made me watch it and <laughs> of course <laughs> and there's a scene where darkness comes out and 
I remember seeing this in a theater when they were playing it again. It was it had to have been like 88, 89 because it was a certain time in my life that I remember. And just seeing his legs, his hooves come out of this dark spot onto the screen on a big screen. Right. And then just seeing the the thorns of his head come out, these massive horns that are coming out, which it just scared the shit out of me <laughs> as a kid. But it enthralled me because there was something about Tim Curry's presence. And I didn't know that was Tim Curry until way later when I was like a teenager. Yeah. That this was the same person that did Hex in, in Fern Gully. That, you know, played the, the main person in Clue. None of that. I never made that connection until I was an adult because he is such a chameleon with all that makeup. Mm-hmm. And you don't recognize him. And it is fascinating Again, it's that. like we said that he just takes on a role. He takes it to the extreme and you don't see him as it's Tim Curry in this role, it's Tim Curry in that role. It's These are the characters that he's brought to life. And I yeah. think you see that in any of them. Even uh, Home Alone 2. Yes. He's my favorite part in that because he just embodies that role of that snooty, busybody hotel clerk. And, you know, it's, and again, it's so much <laughs> it's in his wittiness. facial movements, though, the smiles and the way he, he interacts with Kevin and things like that. And I think that's true in every movie I've seen him in is that it's just so much in how he's interacting with the people around him. Yes. And yes. it's just that presence, that stage presence it that is. you could see that he is a stage actor. And I think that's important because that, it translates to film so much. It does, if you do it correctly. Exactly. And he is part of that, like, uh, actor studio era. Like Broderick, like so many others, uh, De Niro, all these guys that were part of the actor studio in New York. Mm -hmm. And they came out of that atmosphere. So they were trained classically in film acting. Yes. Which is, I think it's one of the three generations mm-hmm. that went through that. Right. Because I think Marlon Brando was a part of that as well. And there was a couple other ones that were technically formally trained as actors. So these guys, their, their command of presence and command of, of the actual medium itself is, there's no comparison to them, to modern acting. Like, people nowadays, they don't chameleon like the the way that this guy does. There's very few that actually have that chameleon-esque feel to it. Yeah, where they embody the role and exactly. you just, you can get immersed in the experience, you know. And it's Gary Oldman is one that he's really one, does well, that. Well, I think any Tim Curry movie you watch, you just become so engrossed with it all the way through. You don't stop and look away. I mean, they're the type of movies that draw you in no matter how many times you've seen them. And I think a lot of it has to do with him and i think if you picture another actor in those roles you can see how the movies would have fallen flat and into obscurity oh, yeah. Yeah. um you know like one of the other ones that i really like that we hadn't talked about was three musketeers yes a small role but yeah. mighty in that movie just and again i love it when he takes on the evil bad guy in music because i think he is so <laughs> freaking good at it he is the best villain like from pennywise to oh yeah to uh darkness he just plays this Thing that it's like I said, he has this commanding esque feel when he walks on the moment that you see him on film, he just takes over that scene. Absolutely. And okay. from the moment that he's just playing this kind of goofy character in it, that that I'm sorry, did we use the word goofy with it with Pennywise? Is that how you're describing? He him? really is goofy in the movie. No, though. he is what terror is made of. I still can't watch that movie. I could rewatch the new ones, no problem now because I've gotten through them. But that is what childhood scarring is made of. Is Tim Curry? I laughed at and, that movie because no. I thought it was amusing as hell. His his portrayal of the character was excellent because he lured kids in. With his presence, and it really felt like that. I think we can all collectively blame him for people's hatred of clowns. I really, really <laughs> do. But that's the kind of iconic role that he took, though. Well, absolutely, but I just I would never use the word goofy for it. Oh, he was goofy as hell when he's on the no. in the library on the on the banister, and he's he's with his legs holding himself on the banister, and flipping this little thing, going ah ha 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 ha. I mean that that's just. <laughs> Bizarre. Tim Curry laugh. Yeah, that that's, that's, he does this little ha 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 ha. <laughs> uh, he does that, and it just you can't help but laugh. But at the same time, you're scared because you know what he represents. You're laughing because you were so terrified. But I just I think that it just speaks to the fact that I, I still 
20 years after seeing that movie, will not touch it with a 10-foot pole because of Tim Curry and his performance in it. I mean, and it can't be... And I, I appreciate the fact that when they remade it, they didn't try to to do that. And we've talked oh, no. a lot about that lately, about people who have taken on iconic roles yeah. and whether or not they did credibility yeah. to it. And one of my biggest things is not trying to recreate what was done originally but make it your own because when you've got those roles like tim curry as pennywise you don't want to touch it you have to yeah. really make it your own because you're not going to be able to recreate the magic that he did in that and role. how much backlash was created because of that like when the when they were going to remake the film that they re they announced it and everything yeah everybody was up in arms they're like oh my god no you do not touch that and that was a tv movie that was a tv movie that is at best a b film yeah but nobody wants to touch his movies mm-hmm. because they are so iconic. Could you imagine can, anyone else taking on Frankenfurter? I mean, no, can you imagine anyone no. else trying to take that on? Hell no. Well, exactly. And it's because of Tim Curry. Like, that's and what we've been saying all along. presence. Because yes. anybody else in that film, I, I know this is going to be blasphemous to a lot of people, but anybody else, any other actor in that film could be replaced easily. I could see a modern version of that. I cannot see imagine, uh, a reimagined version of Frankenfurter. Oh, yeah, no, I completely agree, actually, that anyone else... I mean, I think you're going to get the people who are going diehard. No, that cast is what it is, and they, it was them being together that made that movie so special yeah. and so enduring. I can see people who would say that. I don't agree, but I do agree that it would fall flat without Tim Curry in the role of Frank Inverter. It just would not work. Yeah, and we thought the same thing, though, Pennywise, so, you know... Well, people also said that about Heath Ledger jumping into the role of the Joker, so you never know, I guess. But also, at the same time, his roles... They did a different thing with it. There's not much else you could do with Frankfurter that would take it different. So its character could be a little bit different because he did that goofy-esque feel to it. So I think that... So yeah, I I think that that character is iconic and there's no way around that 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 we could... I can't reimagine those films. Any of the films that, that Tim Curry's been in, they're solidified for me. There's no way to, to rebrand those in that same form. Even, say, Pennywise, that, that has always been his role, though. Yeah. His role was playing the goofy side of that. And we have a dark version now that is played for a very dramatic sense. It's not played for laughs like this one, like the original one. Well, was. and I think that's exactly the same thing with Batman when Jack Nicholson took it as a goofier character, exactly. a goofier version of it versus Heath Ledger who made it a darker version and that's what you need to do. It's like Aladdin would be another prime example. Don't touch Robin Williams' performance, but Will Smith had make to it make different. it his own. Yeah. Do what you can. So. But overall what conclusion wise for for uh, Tim Curry, why do you think his films stand out and stand the test of time, honestly? I honestly think it's just because of his embodiment of the roles and the fact that because he took them on and took them to their extreme and you remember them they become just uh, an imprint in your memory that's the magic of his work and the fact that it has that staying power and you can still be terrified by his performances they they're almost timeless in a way they really are and even in his films that are a little bit more like goofy and kind of like uh not not the best films per se yeah because clue really cinematically it's really not a, a well done film it's not cinema or anything like that but it is an enjoyable movie and it's because of the performances that it stands the test of time yeah even though a lot of the techniques and a lot of the the methodology of the the film itself is very dated it is but i think it's just and you know i think he's one of those people that also as generations go on people will grow to connect with him again, especially in roles like Rocky Horror, where as new generations come in, they connect with it. They connect with Frankenfurter. They'll connect with his movies, and they will continue to, because even if they do get a little bit dated feeling, they're still going to connect with the fact that those characters are so memorable. Yeah, and even the same thing with Legend. Legend, it is... It's not a great film. Mm -hmm. If you take out uh, Tim Curry's performance as Darkness, that movie is really not the best film. I will put it at the, at the level but of that's one never of the great things story. that he was not afraid of taking on a role that was controversial, certainly. Oh yeah, I mean or the one, devil, or one that you know potentially wouldn't do great. I don't think that was ever his driving motivation, and that's the great part is the fact that that didn't limit him to what he was going to do. Then he didn't look at potential commercial success. He looked at I want to take this character on, yeah. and, and I love that. Even seeing him at a at a what do you call it a MegaCon Tampa, 
and his whole aspect of that, like that was his his uh, whole thing that he said. We name dropping. What? This is <laughs> it is relevant. God damn it! <laughs> he actually said that he didn't want to take on roles just because they were going to be iconic. He took on roles because it was gonna it was gonna push his limits, and that's what he chose in films. He chose films that would push the limits of him. He chose a role in Home Alone 2 that could have been a bullshit role. It could have fallen into obscurity and nothing would have happened with that role. But everybody remembers Tim Curry in Home Alone 2. Why? Well, yeah, because he's not hes not a major character in it. And it's interesting that such a major actor would accept a role like that. He's almost on the level of the, the old man shoveling sidewalks. So the first yeah. one, oh, and that's sort of a throwaway. You don't sit there and remember that creepy old man. No. With this, I mean, you remember. But that's the first if, thing you remember in Home Alone 2. Oh, yeah, you remember him. Absolutely. So he elevated every single one of his films. And I think that's, that's the takeaway with this. But the fact that this. he was not afraid to just be a secondary character. And Definitely. still be so iconic. I think that just makes him... It just speaks to his talent. It speaks to his drive and creativity as an artist. And, yeah. yeah. I don't have a lot else to say apart from I love him. And yeah, I think that he's just... Here. He's just amazing. Same here. And his iconic roles will live on forever. I honestly think that between Pennywise, original Pennywise, to uh, Frank Furter, he will be remembered constantly and I think he'll be a standard where people hold themselves up to in terms of really taking on a role and... And pushing the envelope. And pushing it to the extreme. Agreed. Agreed 100%. So uh, thank you guys for checking us out. Please subscribe to the channel. Leave us uh, some feedback. Let us know what we're doing and what you like about this new format that we're doing with Man Bites Retro. Woman Bites Retro. Yeah, sure. We'll all keep arguing that point. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'll always win. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> But uh, please stay tuned for next week, and we'll drop another episode that will be as interesting as this one, I promise. One hopes. Always. Yeah. You know. Okay.